Welcome to our webinar on Preparing for Go Live with SAP HANA. HANA and S4 HANA and cloud migrations are really complex. Sometimes they can be costly and very time consuming. But planning how you're going to operate your S4 HANA system after Go Live is sometimes neglected. We need to think about the end in mind when we start our project planning. Planning for your post migration is essential to the proper operation and security of your SAP systems. We're excited for this webinar, and today we're going to focus on the areas that you need to pay attention to as you manage your S4 HANA system, the operational aspects for managing a complex S4 HANA system, and the post migration security and compliance elements that you need to take into consideration during the project period. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. First, my name's Chance VC. I'm the Senior Vice President of our SAP line of business at Velocity. I've been in the ERP and application managed services space for about 20 years. And I've had the great fortune of working with teams that have brought over 500 organizations live on ERP systems in the private, public, and hybrid cloud. Next, I'd like to introduce Tyler Constable. Tyler, tell us about yourself. Sure, and Chance, Chance thanks again uh, for hosting and having me here today. I'm Tyler Constable, Director of Sales Engineering with uh, Syslink Xandria, a SAP monitoring and management software solution. I've been in the SAP space just shy of 15 years, working with end customers on both project work and all the way down into tests as uh, monitoring and management as well. Great. Thanks, Tyler. And Alan, can you take a moment and introduce uh, everybody to yourself? Yeah, thanks, Chance. Hi, everyone. This is Alan Abel. I'm a Senior Director of Managed Services with Velocity Technology Solutions. I've been working as an SAP consultant for over 22 years. I started at SAP America, and most recently I've been with Velocity at over 13 years, and very excited to be here today to help answer some questions about migration to S4. Great. Well, that's a tremendous amount of experience that the two of you have. So let's start, let's think about that experience. And Tyler, you know, with your experience and thinking about the customers that have gone live, what's that day after go live? What's it been like? And what should people be considering? Yeah. yeah. And, well, you know, when I think of the, the day after the go live, you know, I, I picture a, a conference room, a war room where everyone is, that's part of that project is circled around a table, circle around a phone waiting for phone calls to come in about hey what you know what kind of issues are we having you know and, that, and that's i'm sorry that seems like a really you know old school way to do things where we want to go with this now is more of a dashboard based being able to look at different metrics and values to make sure that everything is behaving okay whether it's performance based or maybe it's just how many end users are logging on at what point and what you know what location what facility um but the hard part is, you know, you do a lot of load testing in your development systems and your quality systems and your pre-production systems. You may do multiple of those going into your production. But, you know, all of those, even with some really good testing, you may not be able to actually experience what that first day is going to be like in those first 24 hours after go live. Right. And Alan, from uh, your experience, what are you sensing on the floor with those business users? Is there using a system for the first time on that first day of go live? Well, there's always a little bit of natural anxiety to be with a new environment. Um, and typically with good data migration and training, the anxiety can be reduced so that the users are fairly comfortable with the new environment and not really getting any surprises. But there's always a few little things that slip through. There might be some issues with a process change that was part of the technical migration. For example, they might be changing how they're doing reporting a little bit with S4, maybe previously in a business warehouse environment, and now they've switched to some of their operational reports to doing it directly in S4. And so maybe some of the users aren't sure how to run the reports. It's a little bit different look and feel. So usually it's just minor look and feel differences, maybe some minor process changes. Occasionally you'll run into some maybe some data migration issues that were not caught during testing. There's always one or two exception pieces of master data customers or, or materials or vendors that might slip through that didn't quite get converted correctly. So those have to be adjusted. And Alan, Tyler mentioned performance and um, 
you know, perhaps doing load testing and having different results once you're live. At Velocity, do you and the teams have a specific recommendation or a standard for where you like to see the integration testing, the user acceptance testing happen, so you minimize those performance changes between pre-production and production? Yeah, so we, we ideally would have a an integration or user acceptance test environment that closely mirrors the production environment in terms mm -hmm. of you know sizing, performance, et cetera. Um, and, and that becomes more important the how depending on how critical it is for that particular customer to be doing you know heavy load testing that simulates production. Some customers don't really have a volume issue in production and they don't have to be quite as concerned with perfectly mirroring that testing. Other customers have a very, very big issue with high volume of transactions and documents and they're much more concerned with migrating to S4 and, and, and frankly looking to S4 to address a lot of those issues. And so certainly for those types of customers, we recommend integration, user acceptance testing, an environment that very, very closely resembles production. Okay. And then you mentioned, you know, uh, data conversion issues sometimes come up, Alan. So I'm sure data cleansing is a key component to ensure a go live. You know, if you were to have that master checklist of things to key considerations to think about before go live, what other things would be on there in addition to data cleansing? Training, of course, anything that's a change in process for key users, uh, whether the screen changes because it's going from ECC to Fiore or just a diff slightly different look and feel in S4, getting mm -hmm. the users really comfortable with those slight differences can really make their transition to S4 much more enjoyable. And um, of course, the data cleansing and data migration is absolutely key. Another uh, I guess softer side of the project that's often overlooked is change management. That's really, really important in ensuring that the business perceives, uh, you know, the new upgrade, the new system as in a very positive light before they ever start using it in production. And that can be, you know, very well managed through certain key communications throughout the project life cycle and then, up, you know, up to right, you know, right before go live. So change management is, is very important. Tyler, from your perspective, what other key considerations would you want to highlight to our audience, you know, to ensure a smooth go live? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of, you know, when you talk about a, a migration of any sort, you know, and today we're talking about Honda migrations, but uh, it's having a good understanding of your source system. So where are you coming from? How does that system behave? The last place you want to be is on your new target system and giving feedback from end users saying, hey, this, this appears to be running slower, but you've got no point of reference. You know, a good strategy is you keep your source system down after you're on your new live system. So if you can't get in there and see how are things running in the past, yeah. that's going to make things very, very difficult. So this not only goes for things like end user response time, but also daily, weekly jobs that may have to run, uh, things that even like month end closing, you know, your month end processes, how are those running in the past? So this isn't something you can just do days going into your migration you need to you know be watching benchmarking for at least a month or two at a minimum yeah and so can you talk us through some examples of how the Xandria tool can help with that type of benchmarking not only during the project phase but also you know right after go live yeah absolutely so the nice thing about having a tool like Xandria on the side is it can pull that data and it'll be a third-party resource where that data can then be held so you can go in and look at that data of how the source system was acting before and how the target system is acting now and put them side by side either on dashboards print out reports you can provide reports to to uh, upper management or to whoever needs it and they can actually just see proof from data then that this is how we were you know performing before this is how we're performing now and give some good quality insights to those performance metrics okay that's excellent. And I'm, I guess I'm assuming those performance metrics, you're going to continue to monitor those during production. What are some of the critical things as a organization's managing an S4 HANA environment they should be looking for, especially, you know, with the insight that the Xandria tools provide? Yeah. Yeah. So when you talk about moving to HANA or migrating to HANA, it's, it's a whole new ballgame. There's a lot of overlapping performance metrics from the traditional databases and traditional SAP systems uh, coming over to HANA, but there are new things you need to watch out for as well. There's um, expensive SQL statements. Oh, this is something 
in your traditional databases and your traditional systems, where we're looking at these things, but more of a weekly, monthly, quarterly thing, you know, more of maybe it's more of a development standpoint or functional standpoint. Uh, but with HANA, you actually have to be looking at expensive SQL statements in real time. So you got to be keeping an eye on these. And if anything starts to trigger, or it looks like it's starting to fall apart or starting to get some performance degradation, we need to make sure that uh, we get those passed along right away. Uh, on top of that, we have something called delta merges. This is, this is gets pretty deep in the weeds here, so I'm going to keep it a little bit higher level. But there's uh, this is essentially this is how HANA reads and writes out of out of the database. Um, so you can do all the fine tuning you can in the world, but if that particular measurement is not working correctly, because within SAP everything's coming in and out of the database, if that's not working well, you know you're not going to get anywhere. So this is an example. Of those two things are some key considerations really to be watching for. Um, Grab the gate when you're now on HANA. Mm -hmm. That's good. And you bring up the new technology of HANA and you know the additional metrics that we'd be looking at, especially with how the database you know interacts. You know, Alan, I, I'm sure training must also be a key consideration that organizations must be you know looking at as they prepare for a smooth go live. Can you talk a little bit about the training needs here? Yeah, the training should really be assuming the users already have some SAP experience in an older version of SAP, the training really should be focused on areas where they might see differences in the S4 environment. For example, one of the uh, big changes for some users is switching from a traditional SAP GUI to the Fiori, which is a much more personalized role-based, uh, browser-based front end. And that can be you know, a little bit of a change. Um, and sometimes, the the hype uh, or the excitement around Fiori might not match you know might not live up to the, the the real world experience of some users and they may just not enjoy it at all and prefer to work with the traditional GUI. We had an example with uh, a real world customer who had a similar situation. Cust they had been live on SAP for years. All of their users very experienced with the traditional uh, GUI. And then they tried to switch to Fiori for some of their users and the users just were not happy with it because they were so comfortable with many, many years with the traditional SAP GUI. So they then started using the traditional GUI with S4. There's still a place for Fiori, but you have to you know, make sure that you're monitoring your users' experience with it and, and make sure they're well prepared for the transition to Fiori if, if it's going to be used in certain cases. Right. And Tyler, as you're working with organizations that are new to, to HANA, are there several key metrics that the Xandria tool captures that you really point customers to to really zero in on uh, so that they, you know, they focus on the right things? Yeah, there are. There are. And so, you know, a couple of the ones I discussed uh, a couple of minutes ago was expensive SQL statements and, um, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, other, other a couple of the other areas, but we're... The nice thing about Xandria, though, is as soon as you get on HANA, it's going to automatically recognize, hey, you've got HANA in place, and it's going to automatically put the correct checks in place. So you don't necessarily have to worry about, you know, what am I missing? What am I going to have to go out and learn? You still need to learn, you know, the, the new administration points of HANA. But with Xandria, it's going to recognize, hey, you're on HANA now, and put the right checks and the right metrics in place for you right out of the gate. Okay, good. Alan, you talked a little bit about you know, user adoption and, and uh, some of the training. Everybody adopts you know, the new systems looking for business benefits. What do you typically see or how would you manage a customer's expectations in terms of how long until they start to see the benefits of adopting S4 HANA? Yeah, that's a great question. And really the answer depends on what their pre-S4 pain points were and you know what they were trying hoping to address with S4. Right. If their pain points were centered around, you know, slow performance for for longer running jobs, maybe they have a weekend COPA settlement job that was mm -hmm. taking you know 24 to 48 hours to complete. That's a real world example from one of our customers. Right. Or maybe month in close was taking too long, or some other custom reports or processes. Um, then they'll notice the benefits immediately, right? If it's really centered around just raw performance improvement, they'll notice the benefit immediately. If the if the improvements were more process oriented, where they had maybe redesigned some of their processes, like for one customer, we redesigned their available to promise logic as part of our S4 migration. 
because they their um, the accuracy or the of their on time delivery was their their metrics were poor and they wanted to improve those and so it takes time to accumulate new results. And, and be able to show to upper management that yes, our on-time delivery now has gone up considerably because of our migration to S4. Right. And Tyler, from your perspective, are you seeing organizations talk about the performance gains or what other areas would you, you know, think a customer might see business benefits immediately after go live? Yeah, yeah, and I completely agree with Alan. You know, it really depends on what those pain points are going into it. If they are performance related, you know, really hope that they would see those performance increases right, right off the gate. Um, but there's also some other technical considerations that, that may play in that um, people don't really think about. So if you come from a traditional platform that maybe isn't a compressed database and you go into HANA or you got a compressed database, you, you may have different growth patterns. In fact, you are going to have different growth patterns once you get onto your target HANA system. So understand what those are and you might actually hit some ROI numbers that you didn't expect just because you're not growing as fast or you know, might not see those types of patterns that you saw prior. So uh, even things like that might surprise you at the end of the day. Right, good point. And Alan, um, as organizations that have been on SAP, before, you know, in EPC and are looking to make that jump to S4 HANA, do you recommend they use that opportunity to realign their business processes to the software or carry forward? Do you, is, is there a way to make a, you know, one size fits all recommendation here? Yeah, the, the typical phrase that you hear on a, a new SAP implementation or a migration or an upgrade is, you know, companies always strive to implement best practice, SAP best practice, which has mm -hmm. a lot of implications. It, it implies that it's a good process, it's a proven process, it's an efficient process. It also suggests that it's a process that SAP supports out of the box that requires, you know, no programming to alter or customize. Right. And so that's, you know, generally the, the theme and the approach of a new implementation or an upgrade or migration where maybe you're trying to realign processes. You always want to do whatever you can to use SAP best practice. Mm -hmm. um, but But there's always some customers who derive a lot of competitive proprietary competitive advantage from some very unique special process right. that they've implemented and they don't want everyone else using it they it's unique to them it makes them different it makes them more competitive and so often you'll run into a few exceptions like that where there's some special configuration or development that's needed to accommodate their you know that competitive advantage that they want to retain right Good point. That competitive advantage, uh, the project team needs to make sure that's taken into consideration and uh, keep those key differentiators uh, modeled in the system. That's a really good point, Alan. Earlier we were talking about performance and perhaps, you know, making sure that we had the right performance at go live so that the end users had a terrific experience. And expectations are high with a with a HANA system that performance is going to be terrific because of the amount of investment. Um, in the technology and in the service. If there are needs to change the capacity that's provided the system because of performance bottlenecks after go live, what would that look like, Alan, to you know, tweak the capacity, whether it's CPU or memory um, or storage? What, what does that consist of in a, for an S4 HANA system and in the cloud? Uh, great question, Chance, and we, we do often address that with our customers. Maybe they're going through a merger or an acquisition and they have a, a sudden increase. Maybe they, you know, with one customer of ours, they double, doubled their transaction volume mm -hmm. and user base with just one, one acquisition. And so wow. we did have to tweak their environment. And typically within our AWS model, we can, you know, we can expand horizontal, horizontally instead of vertically, meaning we can add additional application servers to right. bring in more CPU. And we can do that without any downtime and with storage considerations, as long as they say, stay within the same class of storage and it's extendable storage, we can mm -hmm. do the same with storage. There are some special cases where we might have to switch them to a different class of storage altogether. And we might need, you know, just a couple of hours of downtime to do that. But typically we can handle most of their, you know, CPU, memory and storage adjustments without any production downtime. Okay, great. And that's typically what you're, Alan, you're talking about is business changes after go live. 
I assume if we've done the right testing, Tyler, and we've done the load testing correctly, and we've done the right sizing, you would expect the benchmarks that we're seeing in the Xandria tool to not require any capacity changes immediately upon go live, correct? If we've done all that right? Well, yeah, yeah, you really wouldn't, but uh, even as, as a safe zone though, just, just to you know, really cover yourself, as soon as Xandria's gonna connect to that target system, uh, you're going to be able to watch those metrics and then predict out into the future as to what are those growth rates. You know, are we, you know, did we get that correct? So, you know, now that we're on the new platform, we might see different growth trends than we did prior. So, you know, give it a couple of days or a week, Xander's going to be able to say, hey, at this growth rate, you know, this is how big you're going to be, you know, at the end of the month or next year. And obviously right. that continues to get smarter and smarter as, as time goes on. And as Alan said, you know, there might be situations where it's more of a memory or, you know, CPU that needs to be added and when you're on AWS, you know, the nice thing about Xandria is it can recognize those performance issues and automatically apply those those changes as well, right in line with what Velocity is doing. So uh, some, some great handshake there. Good. Now, as we're going from a project phase into production operations, the security and the compliance requirements, you know, get are much more important. You know, Tyler, what do you see organizations doing as a best practice and what do you recommend in terms of uh, how you really harden that post-migration system once a customer's live to make sure that all the security and compliance requirements are met? Yeah, yeah, and I think this, Chance, this is a great question because I think this gets overlooked uh, quite a lot. There's there's this time in, in, in the migration and depending on you know, different ways you can do a migration, but there's this time kind of when the, the system is ready to be handed off to the business. Mm -hmm. But before it is, we need to make sure that everything is locked back down because during the migration process, you may have had to unlock some clients, change, make things modifiable, maybe, you know, give certain users some more access or unlock some of the more administrative type users like SAPS R&D, depending on, you know, how this is all completed. All of these things have to be locked back down again before you hand it off to the business. On top of that, there are things like the organization's policies. You know, maybe they have password policies on length and, and you know, there are certain numer numerals and characters. All that has to be put in place because an audit is going to come around eventually, whether it's a month, two months, 10 months down the road. You know, and if, if you forget those, you know, I've seen this a million times, they forget to put those policies in place and they go, oh, yeah, you know, we migrated and completely forgot it. So we need a tool set to be able to go in in that, in that gray zone right before you're about to hand it off to the business to go through automatically and within a couple of seconds say, hey, these three or four things uh, are currently opened up. We need to make sure we lock these down before we hand it off to the business. Great points. And, um, you know, oftentimes these projects have a number of people that are involved. And so as the uh, project team rolls off, and you get down to the business users, you know, your recommendations in terms of looking at the security access are, are spot on. Um, Alan, when, when you're, as an engagement manager, working with one of our customers here at Velocity, when do you start to think about talking with the customer and, and declaring success with a migration? How do you do that post-project review to kind of ass uh, ascertain what you've learned so that the next rollout's even better? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And it goes back to something that we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of change management. And there, there's different audiences that are associated with a, a, a big go live like S4 that mm -hmm. ultimately have to be informed of a success. And you probably have different levels of notice and different timing for those audiences. So you have the, uh, you know, the um, immediate project team members and maybe the project executive sponsors and business sponsors that have been very closely aligned with the project from start to finish. And they've right. all probably vested a lot heavily emotionally, uh, a lot of time, a lot of physical investment. Mm -hmm. And so they're all anxious to go live and declare success. And you want to, you know, you want to recognize that, recognize their effort and and that's where you have kind of a cautiously optimistic announcement of success, maybe to the immediate team and to those on the periphery, but who have been involved, like the project, business, and executive sponsors. But it's also with a word of caution. It's like we're, we're technically live on the system and we wanna recognize that success, but at the same time, we don't wanna broadcast to the larger organization who might be um, you know, still experience some pain points for the next few weeks as they get used to the new environment. Let's wait 
a, a week to two weeks and let the system stabilize. Let's run through all of our business cycles. A lot of our business processes in an organization might take you know, some of those processes happen weekly, some of them happen every two weeks, some of them only happen once a month. Mm -hmm. And you really want to get a chance to cycle through all those processes in the new environment before fully, you know, declaring victory and success, success and then and using that message to promote, you know, through change management, promote a positive perception of the new environment. If you declare that overall message of victory to the whole audience day one, there is the risk that you know, a few days later, you could uncover some issues that just hadn't surfaced right away. And then right. everyone on the project team has egg on their face, so to speak, right? They <laughs> have to you know, explain why, you know, the mission was said to be completed, but now they're having all these issues. So it's just um, different audiences and different timing for that message. Yeah, Tyler, I'm sure you see something similar, but can you talk to us about your perspective on how you manage customer expectations and and talk about the success of a migration while you know rewarding those folks that have worked so hard on you know this marathon of of getting live yeah yeah and i completely agree with alan it really it depends on, on who you talk to because as a former basis person if i got the the system up and running on the new target system and, and there's no data corruption you know run away i'm good i'm good you know and that's that's really not the case but you know that's just the way uh, it seems like, you know, a lot of us think when we're from the basis side, and of course, you know, I'm joking, there's obviously performance things that you got to keep an eye out, but there are going to be things, like Alan mentioned, that a week or two weeks on the road that haven't run in the first 24 hours, first 48 hours, that might put a huge, you know, a significant heavy load on the system, whether it's performance-based or it's data-based, and that might really send up um, some performance issues, not even within that team, it may affect a team that's, you know, doing something completely different. You know, it's just the way SAP works. So um, I guess I echo Alan's um, comments that, you know, you, you got to wait a couple weeks really before you start to declare, you know, a, a complete success. And of course, yeah, I think you need to pat some of the people on the back that, you know, that did that, that migration over that weekend, you know, and we're up for 48 hours. You know, definitely give them a pat on the back right away. But um, a true success is definitely going to take a couple weeks to a month afterwards to declare. Gotcha. Well, great analysis, um, and we've got some questions coming in, but before we get to those, I want to put both of you on the spot here with one final question, and that's to take a step back and think about, you know, what is the single most important advice you'd have for someone starting their project now to upgrade to S4 HANA? So that one nugget of advice you'd give anybody who's just now starting their journey to adopt and upgrade to S4 HANA. What would it be, Tyler? Okay, on, on the spot. Um, so, from a a Sysling Xandria monitoring and management standpoint, I would say it's all about benchmarking that source system, having a very having deep insights into how that system ran, understanding how repetitive jobs have ran in the past. You know, to the, how long do they run? Right. Uh, all the way to full business processes. You know, how long was a business process that was month end closing or, or whatever that is you know what you know, where did where did you see issues in the past how long did it take in the past how long were each of those under you know underlying components taking of that process uh if you don't have benchmarking documented correctly or in a system that you can go and access it's really going to make your life very very painful later if you know when you're on the target system it's just natural behavior End users might say, hey, something is just a hair of a fraction off. Everyone goes, oh my gosh, and they run around saying, it's the new system, it's the new system. And so you really need to have some good data behind you there. Alan? Uh, I would say contingency planning in your project plan. That's probably the one thing that's it's real tempting to omit because everyone wants to get the project done as quickly as possible. And even though you might put together a very realistic project plan, I would still build in to both my, my sprint cycle testing and my user acceptance testing. I would build in a contingency for, to do an additional sprint cycle if needed or an additional round of user acceptance testing if needed. Maybe they won't be needed, but I would build those in as contingencies just in case they are. Because oftentimes it tends to take longer to finish unit and user acceptance testing usually takes longer than everyone thought it would take. 
Yeah, and uh, oftentimes the testers have a day job, right, to run the business, and so they're being pulled in multiple different directions, and, you know, uh, that's great advice to have the right amount of contingency planning into the project plan. Well, terrific, uh, Alan and Tyler. We, we've, uh, I'm going to now have the questions come from the audience, and so we've got several that have queued up here, and so uh, let's go to the first one. Um, First one is, my organization is considering moving to the cloud, and we're looking to migrate to HANA at the same time. You know, is that something that we should consider, or should we do it in a two-step process, cloud first and then HANA? Alan, do you have a perspective of whether an organization should do HANA and the cloud migration at the same time, or split it up into two separate projects, getting the cloud first and then to HANA? Great question. I know technically it's possible. Um, SAP does support that type of a migration upgrade, and uh, we've done it, and it certainly can work. It really depends on the, the, I guess, the business cycles of the organization making the change, and if they want to try to maybe minimize some risk or minimize a little bit of downtime to their business um, or change to the users, then you could easily break it up. But Typically, most companies would prefer to just get it over in one step. Right, right. Tyler, do you have a perspective on that question? Yeah, I'd have to agree. So, uh, you know, you definitely don't have to do them together. Uh, you can do them separate. But, uh, Chance, you had made a note of something just a minute or two ago that, you know, the testers have other jobs right. that they have to do in the business. So, um, by doing them together, you kind of, you know, the testers are doing one cycle of testing. They're not going to do one now and then one six months down the road. Um, but really, you know, and I agree with what Alan said too. It's going to come down to the business cycles. You know, can you? Is is this the right time to do it together? Do you really want to break them up? And if you do, you know, can the business afford whatever downtime there may have to be for that? Right. And Alan, the next question we have is a little bit related. So, a customer wants to move to the cloud. Um, but they want to stay on ECC, no plans of going to S4. The question is, what's the impact of not moving to S4? Well, in the short term, there's no impact other than it's less change, right? So it's an easier transition for them. It would be really invisible to the users. It should be invisible to the users, right? I think the longer term impact is, you know, the fact that there's the mandate from SAP that uh, by 2025, they must migrate to S4. So it's just really a matter of where in the planning horizon of, of each individual company where, when they want to make that move to S4. They they will eventually have to do it. Um, so you know, it, in in most cases, most of the customers that we're talking to that are doing a new greenfield implementation of S4, or they're upgrading, you know, doing a, a brownfield migration or upgrade from ECC to S4. Um, they they're they're pretty anxious to get it done now, so they right. can take advantages take advantages of the improvements from S4 sooner rather than later. Yep. Good points. Our next question, Tyler, is for you. It, uh, it's coming in and it says, if we're starting a project, at what point in the project should we install the Xandria tool to monitor our SAP system? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So. Um, I wrote the whole presentation here. I've been harping on this benchmarking process. Yeah. So to really do that well, you're going to have to get at least a couple months. I'd say, to be honest, a quarter would be great. If you get at least three months worth of, of data, that's yeah. going to help you really get some good averages on the month end processes. It's going to really help on your, your average times around the daily jobs and the weekly jobs. So yeah, if you're going to go, if you're, you're going to go into a project and use Xandria for your benchmarking, I'd say at least three months beforehand, get that, um, get it all in place so it can start to see some good metrics uh, right out of the gate. Good. Tyler and Alan, thank you so much today for sharing your knowledge and your expertise on how to manage an S4 HANA system the day after go live and how to plan for that go live. This has been tremendous. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. We look forward to seeing you and meeting many of you at Sapphire. You can find Velocity at booth 1932 and see Sisling Xandria at booth 2246. Right now, we've got a 
another webinar that's going to expand upon this subject that we've talked about today in terms of managing your S4 HANA system. And that webinar or that briefing is in booth 2248 on Wednesday, May 8th at 1.30 Eastern. We look forward to seeing you there in the SUSE booth at booth 2246 on Wednesday, May 8th at 1.30. If you have follow-up questions for us after seeing this webinar, we encourage you to reach out to us. Additional information can be reached at velocitycloud.com and at syslink Xandria. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to meeting you in person.